today from uh, Ines de Leon and CNRS, where he's a director of research and also a professor. Uh, so uh, Freddie has uh, spent time at uh, Los Alamos National Lab and at uh, Nice. And I was interested to see that you were a high school math teacher early in your career. <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, so welcome to Boulder. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Brad, for the introduction. Thanks for the, all the organizers for inviting me. It's really a, a pleasure for, for me to, to be here. Um, so Boulder is uh, so nice, and the research uh, here in the US is, is, is so interesting. So I am a specialist of statistical physics. So I was trained in statistical physics. But I always worked on application of statistical physics to turbulence problem. And uh, more and more, I apply it to turbulence problem related to, to, to climate dynamics. So uh, I will talk. So one of the key tools in the statistical mechanics is a large deviation theory. And so it's, uh, it's large deviation theory is the modern language of statistical uh, physics and statistical mechanics. And so I will discuss several applications of large deviation theory uh, to turbulence, atmosphere, and climate dynamics. So deviation theory, it's a way to, to be able to describe the typical state of the systems, the typical fluctuation of the systems, but also to discuss fluctuation that are very rare. And so it's, it's, it is especially useful to, in connection to the study of rare events. Uh, uh, and we will apply this to several kinds of rare events. So for instance, climate extreme events. Do you hear me well? Yeah? OK, so so in, stati so in statistical mechanics, you, you, you have a set of uh, theoretical tools and so and, or mathematical tools. So for instance, you, the basics is probability theory. And the large deviation theory is a subset of uh, probability theory. But we also use, as far as the dynamic is concerned, averaging and stochastic averaging techniques, what are called often reduction methods by, uh, by physicists. And we also use dynamical system theory and ergodic theory or linear response theory. And so all these tools are uh, needed and useful in order to study dynamical problems. And so this is, here I, I will specifically focus on large deviation theory. But uh, I mean, actually, as you will see, uh, all these tools are, are very useful. And so it's not, so I will speak about uh, only uh, hydrodynamical uh, problems. And so what, uh, what we do using statistical uh, mechanics and statistical physics is very complementary to the usual uh, lecture you have on, uh, on hydrodynamics. So for instance, uh, uh, the, the lecture you have this, this week, typical lecture in, in, in turbulence theory, for instance, by, by Keith or or uh, by Hussein. So they are very complementary to what we do here. So what we do here, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually rooted on uh, the, the classical approach. But on top of the classical approach, we, we, we try to provide new tools in order to study the, the dynamics uh, and the statistics of uh, the, the, the dynamics. So what is large deviation theory? So large deviation theory it, it is a general framework to describe probability distribution in, in asymptotic limits. And so you look at the, the probability that a, a random variable x is equal to x. So this is just the PDF. So P of x is the PDF. So here, the, the PDF depends on some uh, external parameter, epsilon. And so you, you look at uh, the uh, behavior of this probability distribution function when epsilon is very small. And so if you can, find uh, uh, an asymptotic behavior where p of x and epsilon goes like the exponential of minus f of x divided by epsilon. So this uh, strange symbol here means uh, logarithm equivalence, roughly speaking. It means that the, the log of the left-hand side is equivalent to the log of the right-hand side. But I will define this more precisely later on. Then you say, if you have this, you say that you have a large deviation principle. And so you call f the large deviation rate function and epsilon the large deviation rate. 
And so this is extremely useful, as you, as you will see later. And uh, this, this is used quite a lot in, in theoretical, modern theoretical development in statistical physics. And so, for instance, the first example uh, is related to equilibrium statistical mechanics. So in equilibrium statistical mechanics, F could be the free energy, and epsilon could be KBT divided by N where uh, Kb is the Boltzmann constant, T the temperature, and N the, the numbers of particles. And so then you see that uh, the free energy is a large deviation rate function, uh, and epsilon uh, is just related to, uh, for instance, the, the, the thermodynamical limit. And X would be uh, any macroscopic uh, description of your field. It could be a magnetic field. It, 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 sorry, it could be the, the magnetization, it could be the density, it could be the volume, and anything which is relevant to describe your, your system. And so actually this is true for all the, the thermodynamical potential. So F could be the free energy, but it could be also the entropy or any other of the thermodynamical potential depending on the statistics you, you are considering. And so this, this was developed, actually the, 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 the basic tools comes from physicists. Uh, physicists are developing this uh, using many kinds of tools. One, one key tool is um, path integral as far as the uh, dynamical problem are concerned. But actually mathematicians have worked a lot in parallel with the physicists, uh, trying to formalize the computation and to make the reasoning more simple and more straightforward. And so for instance, in math, there is a Kramer in the, uh, already in the 1930s, and then Sanoff in the 1950s. We will see the Kramer and Sanoff theorem, which are basic result in large deviation theory. And then uh, many people apply it to statistical mechanics. For instance, Landford is a key name in the 70s, and Friding Van Zell in the 70s about dynamics, and so on and so forth. So I will try to give you today a basic lecture on a large deviation theory, and then uh, the next two lectures to give you application in, in turbulence and, uh, and, and climate. So this is the, the plan. So today it's an, an introduction. I, I, I will also give you several motivation and I will insist on application to dynamical problems. So we will look at large deviation for dynamics, what is called a path large deviation or dynamical large deviation. And then uh, today we will discuss application for kinetic theories. Some of them apply for describing turbulent flows, for instance, geostrophic turbulence, and the uh, atmosphere uh, dynamics. And uh, finally, on Friday, I will use this to uh, make application in climate dynamics. And so we will use uh, ideas that come from statistical physics and uh, large deviation theory to sample extreme heat waves. And we will also couple this with a machine learning approach uh, in order to be able to compute these things uh, for, for uh, actual application in, in, in complex dynamics. Okay, so I start my lecture for today. So please uh, stop me and ask me any, any question. I, I have seen that uh, you are very active and ask a lot of questions. So this is really very good. So I hope you will stop me uh, a lot. So I will begin by giving some uh, motivation just by showing some example of uh, physical phenomena in turbulence and climate where uh, we have used large deviation theory or other people have used large deviation theory and it was very useful. So something I am very interested in, but we are not yet able to, to do anything about it, but it's a, it's a long-term project. It is uh, related to some kinds of abrupt climate change that we see the earth dynamics. So this is a typical example. And so here you see uh, the, 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 the proxies for the temperature. And so the, uh, the, the blue curve is related to measurement in the Greenland of uh, uh, oxygen isotopes from which you are able to uh, describe uh, something like the temperature in the, in the, in the northern uh, uh, Atlantic part of the Earth. And the green one is, is, uh, comes from sediments uh, that are uh, found in the ocean. 
and for which are and this, they are also proxy for temperature. So you, you can derive back some temperatures. So here you have the, the temperature scale, and uh, here you, you have time. And so you see, time goes from uh, 10,000 years ago until 60,000 years ago. So it goes uh, forward. So this is backward in time. Okay. And so the present climate is somewhere here. It is not represented. The last 10,000 years, what is called Holocene, and it, it is very stable. But, and this is mainly the last glacial period. And so you see that during the, the last glacial period, so the, the temperature on average was much smaller than the temperature now by about uh, five degrees. But what you see is that it was actually very uh, jerky with lots of fluctuation. And I, I, will show, uh, I will not show you the, the picture today, but now uh, the colleagues in geophysics are able to, to have a resolution which is much better. And actually what you see is that you have very strong jump of a few degrees that occurs during time scale, which is smaller than uh, 10 years, probably of the order of one year. So it means that very suddenly in the North Atlantic uh, area, you have jump in temperature, which are huge. Five degrees, it is what we expect for climate change if we have, have business as usual uh, within the end of the century. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge change. And so those changes are natural. Uh, uh, they are just related to the, the normal dynamics of the Earth. And so those, those abrupt climate change do exist in the past, uh, uh, did exist in the past. So they did exist at, at several time scales. So this is during the last glacial period. But we hope that they will not exist in the future because uh, you know, it would be a huge uh, problem for adaptation for our, our society. And so the point here is to, to understand whether this uh, uh, abrupt climate change, whether they are driven by uh, something external or spontaneous. Uh, spontaneous, I mean, just due to the internal variability of, of the dynamics of the of, of. And so at this time scale here, so on longer time scale, on time scale of uh, 40,000 years or 100,000 years, the Earth dynamics is driven by some uh, astronomical parameter, for instance, the tilt, of the Earth, the eccentricity, and other parameters like that, that have frequency of order of uh, 40,000 years, or 100,000 years or more. This is what basically drive the, the cycle between glacial and uh, interglacial periods. But here we, you see that we are at a time scale which is much faster, about uh, thousands of years, and there is no external driver to the dynamic. To, to the system. So it means that those, those fluctuations are due to the internal variability of the systems. So it's basically the coupling of the turbulence of the ocean with the turbulence of the atmosphere and with ice. And so this is basically the kinds of things that we study in, in climate dynamics. And so here the key point is to understand uh, those very fast transition and to see if they are just uh, 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 stochastically driven by internal variability or if they are rather following some limit cycle or, or other kinds of uh, dynamics. So there are two different proxy. So we cannot measure, nobody was able to measure the temperature directly. So, but the, time, the temperature affected some other processes. And so then we look at these other processes and we infer from them the temperature. So the two curves are two proxy of the temperature. And so there are two ways to measure indirectly the temperature. And so, you, so the blue one is ice core data and the green one comes from sediments in the, in the, in the ocean. Okay. How, do we, how do we know the Well, there, there, so I, I would say that given the, the kinds of measurement we do and the lack of uh, data we have, they agree quite well, actually. Okay, so you see, if we disagree, it is by about uh, uh, 
a small fraction of a degree. And so there it, this, the fact that they agree within a, a small fraction of a degree is a sign that uh, we are measuring something really. I mean, we have two independent ways to, to measure the same thing. So the new one, you're talking about basically what has been fluctuating for very small time frame. And that's what we want to look at. I guess my question is, how do we know the small time frame? Oh, so, 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 here the, so you should ask the question, until which, uh, 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 until which time uh, are the fluctuations relevant for describing fluctuation of temperature? And so actually, in the most recent uh, measurement, they don't use uh, the, the problem is that in the ice core, this uh, oxygen in the ice core there are processes that make the oxygen uh, diffuse, and so then it's uh, it's. it's the, uh, the resolution, and so you cannot have a very good resolution from the point of using this. So more recently, they have used uh, uh, carbonates, uh, uh, dust, and dust is diffusing much less. And with dust, they have a, resolu a temporal resolution which is much better than than uh, this one. Okay, but we are quite far from yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I must say that I am not at all a specialist, but uh, uh, well, I, I as a, as a non-specialist, I am very impressed actually about what by what they are able to 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 do. So I am unable to to answer precisely your question about uh, the, the the level of uh, the fluctuation. Okay, so I will speak. So as I told you, we are not yet able to study this abrupt climate change for the Earth, but we did uh, some things related to abrupt climate change in uh, uh, for for uh, simple models of uh, Jupiter troposphere. And so you see here a, a, a classical picture of Jupiter troposphere, and so you see this uh, this bands here, uh, and so the, those those bands. Are uh, correlated to the vorticity of the flow, as I will show you uh, later. And so the fact that there are bands like that means that the flow, the, the turbulent flow, uh, is uh, nearly uh, oriented in the east west direction. So, of course, there are also vortices. So, you can see here the great red spot with a giant anticyclone, and here the, the white ovals, uh, which were. Uh, uh, sm smaller anticyclones, but you see that mainly the flow is, is uh, in the direction uh, east-west. And so you see here a, a very old picture. So it's a set of pictures that come from Voyager data. So this was very long ago. And so you see uh, you, you see the motion. So the Reynolds number is huge. So it, it is much larger than uh, anything you can find uh, on the Earth. And so you, you, have a, you expect to have a very turbulent flow. Uh, so usually when you look at a turbulent flow, for instance, on a river or uh, anywhere else behind a car or something like that, so you never see uh, 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 structure that lasts long. I mean, usually in turbulent flow, uh, everything is very unstable. And so you, you, you try to describe the, the statistics of this unstable fluctuation. So here the point is that by contrast, on Jupiter, it is very stable. And so the great red spot was observed already by uh, uh, 60, uh, 60 or 70 years after Galileo first to use his, uh, his uh, telescope. And so it, it, it was there, and it's still there. And those bands uh, are nearly unchanged for a very long time. So for instance, here, what you can see uh, are measurement of uh, the zonal winds meaning the east-west component of the velocity. So you see here the velocity. So you see velocities of order of hundreds of meters per second. So you see a very strong uh, uh, eastward jet, uh, as was already shown by, 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 by Keith. And so you, and so you see um, alternating westward and eastward jets. So there, there are about 12 jets 
for the northern hemisphere part of uh, uh, Jupiter, and you about the, the same number in the southern part. So for the Earth dynamics, you have also these jets. So, but there are mainly two jets, one per hemisphere, and the, the, they are called the jet stream. And the jet stream on the, for Earth are very unstable by contrast with Jupiter one that are, that are very stable. And so here you, are, you can actually see two curves, uh, a black one, uh, uh, one comes from Voyager data and the other one from Cassini data. And so those were two spacecraft and in between those two spacecraft, 25 years has passed. And so you, you can see that within 25 years, I mean, the jet were, uh, have not changed. They are basically stationary on this time scale with maybe a, a small fluctu fluctuation. Here. So the point is that it has not always been like that. Uh, so during the period 1939-1940, one of these jets suddenly disappeared, and it actually produced uh, this free uh, uh, white uh, anticyclone that you can see here. And uh, uh, Phil Marcus, a uh, colleague from Berkeley, calls uh, this event uh, uh, Jupiter's abrupt climate change. So why did he call it this way? I mean, it's Again, it's, uh, it's the, the turbulent organization of the troposphere of Jupiter. So it's a, it's, it's a turbulent flow. It is driven by a, a both a, a deep convection and by the, the sun that uh, uh, is uh, eating differentially the poles and the equator. And <clears throat> this turbulent flow self-organizes. So it gives the structure of uh, the flow. So this is what you would call climate on Earth. And suddenly, uh, the, the structure has changed. And so he, he called it uh, uh, an abrupt climate change. So here, we have no clue that uh, anything external as, uh, was, was driving this events. So it's a very natural hypothesis to assume that it is just due to the, the normal stochasticity of the systems. And so you can see that if this is the case, this, this occurs. Uh, very rarely, because we have seen it only once uh, during the last century and probably during the last three century. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this, so this time scale of a century is huge compared to the typical time scale involved for this uh, turbulent flow, which are about, uh, which are rather uh, of a, a, a few, of a few, a few months. Oh, it's uh, it's uh, here, right? It's where the, where the you see the white of here. So it's right below the. So so here you have, uh, I guess, the great white spot is on this band here. So, so it's it's one of. The, okay, so the fact that you can have very rare transition in a, in the systems is very common in all fields of physics. And so you have already, so for instance, you, you have learned in, a, in a, your first year of scientific studies, but in chemistry, you have huge timescale differences. You can have timescale of order of nanosecond, milliseconds, and then you have reaction that occur on any other timescale. It could be uh, in timescale of a minute, uh, or an hour of a century, or whatever, and so you you can have in in, in all, all physical systems huge time scale differences, and so most of the times these huge time scale differences are related to the fact that uh, the systems can reach uh, an attractor where it's it is local it seems to be locally stationary, uh, and it can stay there a very long time, but from time to time because of a rare fluctuation it can exit the basin of attraction of this attractor and find another attractor. And so this is what is called the multi-stability. And so you have learned uh, uh, the, that uh, there are laws that describe the, the probability to have this transition in chemistry. So one law is called Arrhenius law, where you see that the probability to have such a transition goes like the exponential of minus something, for instance, the free energy divided by KBT. So the Arrhenius law was found by, by Arrhenius empirically uh, at the, I don't remember exactly when, at the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. And then it has been understood uh, theoretically and mathematically. 
And so here, uh, the, the one of the key the question we will ask is, can this be valid also for turbulent flow, this uh, Arrhenius flow? Okay, so it seems a bit strange because you know the Arrhenius law related to thermodynamics and related to equilibrium statistical mechanics. So it, it doesn't seem obvious that it should be the, the case. So this will be one question I will, I will ask. So before to go there, I just want to stress that such rare transition in turbulent flow uh, are very common. They are, they actually, in, in experimental setup, they occur in mainly all uh, experimental setup, not for every parameter. So usually they are localized in some special regime, but they are very common. So uh, uh, Keith sh has shown us uh, several examples or talked about several examples. And so this is uh, another one, uh, which is related to the magnetic field reversal. So you remember Keith shown the time series of the polarity of uh, the magnetic field for the, for the Earth. And so this is uh, similar things, but for an experiment. And so this was actually done by some colleagues in, uh, in ENS de Lyon and in ENS Paris and uh, in uh, Saclay. This is called the v VKS experiment. And so they were the, the first to make a self-sustained turbulent dynamo. Uh, I don't remember when, maybe 15 years ago, or something like that. So you have an MHD experiment. So it's a, it's a liquid metal. So it is driven by some uh, propellers. And then it will produce a magnetic field uh, uh, just because of the, the turbulent motion. And uh, this magnetic field will be self-sustained and it will constantly interact with the turbulence. So this is the, the basically the mechanism that produces magnetic fields for the Earth or for many, many stars in, in the in, 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 the, in the universe. And so here you can, I will describe you the red curve. So the red curve show you this magnetic field as a function of time in this experiment. And so you see that uh, you have a positive polarity and then you have a sudden change, a negative polarity, a sudden change, a positive polarity, and so on and so forth. And so those are extremely rare in the sense that the typical time you have to wait in between two events is much, much longer orders of magnitude longer than the typical time for the, 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 the turbulent organization of the flow. And so it's exactly like in chemistry, or it's, it's exactly like uh, when you have a radioactive decay. Uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as uh, when you have, uh, uh, in statistical mechanics, two phases, for instance, a uh, uh, ferromagnet, which a uh, positive phase and a negative phase, and suddenly it changed, but it is very rare. And so the point is that uh, if there is a general argument that I will tell again later, it's that if the time scale for this event is much longer than the, the time scale for, the, the, for the, the system to lose its memory, then you call this a memoryless uh, thing. And if it's memoryless, you expect to have uh, a Poisson statistics for describing this event. So here, just roughly speaking, it means that the, the distribution of, of, of the waiting time in between two events uh, will be an exponential. Uh, and I will show you some example later. So it means that it's from the point of time-wise, it's completely random. It's just given by uh, the rate of this transition of the uh, average time to have this transition. And so for instance, one of the, uh, uh, first connection between probability theory and uh, physics was in at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, uh, the, the 20th century, uh, 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 where people, uh, after discovering uh, radioactive decay and so on, they were checking using the, the modern probability theory of that time. Actually, this event were completely random. Okay, so it's, it's so here in this case is it, it it will be the same. The, the transition from one state to the other will be completely random time-wise. But here, what uh, our colleagues have done, so this has been done by Francois Petrelis, is to plot, uh, to take all these transitions they, they were observing and to plot them on the same graph. And so here you can see uh, again the, the red curve, a magnetic field uh, for one probe. And you see that this is the, the positive polarity, the negative polarity. And so you see how the transition occurs. So you see the time scale are not at all the same. It is uh, zoomed uh, out. And so you see here the detail of the transition. So you see it very, 
There is a specific dynamics. It goes this way. You have an overshot, and then you come back. And so what you can see is that all the transition here superimpose close to a very to a single curve. Okay, so this is kind of striking because I have told you that time-wise the transition is completely random, but it seems that the way the transition occurs, uh, it seems to be going towards something that might be predictable. And so this, uh, this uh, th things that, that could be predictable, it is what I will call in the following an instant on. Uh, I will explain you why we call it instant on later on. And so this is one of the key things I would like to explain you uh, today. And uh, I will show you many other examples of instant on, uh, on flows uh, in uh, during this, uh, this lecture. So this, I will answer your question with this plot. So this is, I will, one of, I will explain this uh, instant on. So those are instant on for uh, the toy model of Jupiter transition. And so here you have inside this red blob or blue blob, 90% uh, of the transition that go from one attractor to another. I, I describe this better later. And so this is the kind of thing we would like to, to be able to study numerically and theoretically and to, to understand. And to understand the Peter question, so here you see uh, the forward transition and the backward transition, and they, they are actually different. And so if we are in an equilibrium systems, there are a time reversal symmetry, and then we have a symmetry between forward and backward transition. Sometimes you just have to invert the velocity, or sometimes it's a pure symmetry, it's exactly the same. But here in this case, it's a non-equilibrium problem. It's a problem which is forced, and uh, and dissipated, and there is no relation between the forcing phenomena and the dissipation phenomena. So in this case, there is absolutely no reason why there should be any symmetry, and they are actually they are actually different. Oh, uh, oh so okay, so so here here I guess it's just. Uh, plus minus symmetry, Z2 symmetry. So they are probably symmetric just for this reason. But here on Jupiter, it's different. I mean, we, we lose one jet or we gain one jet and there is no obvious symmetry. Yes? So it means that we, it, it exactly means that in principle, we should be able to calculate it. But then in practice, it might be very difficult. And so I will show you several examples where we are actually able to calculate it uh, from a theoretical approach. And some other cases where just like you say, we are just able to check that uh, it works this way uh, empirically using numerical simulation or, or experiments. Both will be, be true. So do you have any other question? Okay, so here you see that, so this abrupt change, you see they are very rare, but they really matter because basically it's what explain you the, the long history of the system, okay? If you, have a, if, if, you, if you are a chemist, you really matter about this transition even if they are really rare. You don't care about the, the nano or microsecond fluctuation. You care about the reaction that will occur, uh, that will finally occur, and this is what you, you you want. So here it's the same. I mean, if you if you if you can change the, your climate or your polarity, it might be a very relevant, but it really matter. Okay, it, it's really what will explain the story of your system. And so this is why we care about large deviation. I mean, very rare fluctuation. There is another example where we can care about relevance. It is when they have a huge impact. Then you have a very small probability, but you have a huge impact. Okay, so uh, then you don't need to have a, a, a transition from one attractor to another. You can stay in the same attractor, but still the, the, the rare event will have a huge impact. And the typical example are extreme events in a climate system. So the extreme events can be rare, but 
as they will occur and they will uh, have a huge impact, you still need to estimate this very small uh, probability to make sure that you are well prepared in terms of uh, risk and, and, and so on. And so I will discuss uh, several of these examples, so mainly about extreme heat waves, but in principle, we can apply it to many other examples. And so this is a, a old picture of the 2003 heat waves over Western Europe. So what you can see here is uh, the temperature anomaly. So it is the temperature during this period in 2003 minus the temperature during the, the previous years the, the, and the, the, the year afterward. And so you see that that year during a, a month, the temperature on average was 10 degrees larger than uh, usually. And so you see here a 10 degree difference. So uh, on, the, on Sunday, it was 36 or 34. And uh, on Monday, it was 26 or something. So a 10 degree difference on average during a month, it is something huge. Uh, so it's a typical fluctuation of the weather, but the fact that it lasts one month uh, it, it tells you that it sometimes during this month it was more than 10 degrees and the average of 10 degrees is it's really something huge it's a bit like having 36 degrees during a month duration here in, in Boulder and so actually the impact was huge I mean uh, here you can probably not read it but it's this is in Paris and it's written here that if you have lost one of your relative or something then you have a, a uh, special number to call. I mean, the, 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 the hospital and the state services in France were completely overwhelmed at that time and in other Western countries, uh, uh, Western European countries. And so basically 70,000 people died on top of usual number during a month, during that period. So it was, uh, it was more localized in time, but it's the same order of magnitude as the impact of uh, COVID, if you want, in terms of just death related. Problem. So, of course, we care. And the basic question here is uh, what is the probability of this event to come back? Uh, what is its probability in the uh, current climate? What is its probability in the pre industrial climate? What would be this, its probability in future climate if we assume some, uh, some uh, emission scenario? Yes? I have a question about the risk. So, it's so largely do you also care about how local yeah right so here i will here i will have to define properly the event to choose an observable and then i will look, look at the, the tail of the pdf for this observable and so of course uh, the the, its probability will depend very much on how you define the event. And for instance, it will depend very much on whether you are looking at this fluctuation on a scale which is at the size of a country or a continent or smaller. And so you, 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 you will have to be very careful about uh, the statement you, you might do because as soon as you will change the definition, everything will, will, will change. And so this is a big problem in what we call the attribution studies in climate. I mean, just to be able to be coherent and that everybody use the, the same definition. And so here again, we expect this, uh, uh, this very rare event to, to be very rare. And with the same reasoning as the one I did before, if it is rare enough, such that the system loses the memory of its initial condition, then we expect it to be random in time in a, in a, in a, in a way that I will explain again. So here I have just plotted a very simple example. So this is what is called a orstein lundbeck process. So probably you know about it. It's just, uh, uh, just like uh, uh, an autoregressive process of order one, but continuous in time. So it means that you, you just have a, a Langevin dynamics for which you have dx over dt is minus alpha x plus a uh, uh, noise. For instance, in equilibrium statistics called mechanics, you have these kinds of noise. Okay, so it's, it's a linear dynamic. Everything is extremely simple. And so here you see the, uh, so this a of t is just like my x here. And so you see how it evolves in time. And so 
One is the typical time scale. Alpha would be equal to one in this case. And you see here, we are looking at that time scale of order of a, a few, few hundreds or thousands. And so then we, we, we choose a threshold uh, arbitrarily. This is our choice. So here, the threshold is a, a 3.5 sigma or something like that. So this is this red dashed line. And then we look at when the, the signal goes above the threshold. And this defines these dots here, these uh, this points. And if you look at the, so then the, the reasoning is the following, is that because the, those time much longer than the correlation times of the dynamics, then we expect that the, the probability to see an event during an interval of time, it does not depend on the, on, 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 on the detail of the dynamics. And it's it just proportional to the length of the, to the length of the, the, the time interval. So you just have a, a proportionality coefficient. So I will show you the, the equation afterward. So if you do that, then you find that uh, the, 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 the typical time, the, the time between two of these red points should be given by an exponential. And you can see here the PDF. So this is the waiting time. And so this is the PDF. And you see here the, um, we, we have just been the, the time, and you see the exponential fit. So the, the fit here is, is, is very good. And so this will be always the case if you can make sure that you have lost the memory of uh, your, your initial condition. Then those red dots are distributed on the timeline uh, by something which is called the Poisson process. Basically, you, you have uh, exponential waiting time in between two points. So if this is the case, then the only thing that matters, if you are interested in the statistics here, it is the rate of this process or the, the rate of the decay for this exponential. And so here I, I did not this rate lambda, and lambda, if you just look at the average time, the average of uh, over this exponential, it will be just one over lambda. So you have a rate lambda, an average time, which is one over lambda. And so then this average time is also called the return time. And so for instance, this is what uh, people want, the, the time of curve that people that deal with risk, risk management, for instance, an insurance company or a government uh, uh, office, if they want to deal with risk, what they want is to have a, what they call the return time plot. So it's a curve for, on, for which on one axis you have a return time and on the other axis you have the amplitude of the event. And so for instance, this is an example of a return time plot for extreme heat waves. I will discuss it better on Friday. And so here you can see, so you have a, the, the time. So here it's a, a logarithmic time scale. So here you can see the 100 year heat waves so you have its amplitude. So it basically means it's basically the amplitude of an heat wave that would come back uh, every 100 years on average. Or it's basically the amplitude of the heat waves that would come next year with probability one divided by 100. And then you can you can have here the, the different probabilities associated to the different risk. Yes. On this curve here, it's of order one, yes. Alpha is equal to one in this case. Oh no, no, it's not straightforward to. It, well, it's hard to say uh, uh, something general about that, but. Uh, uh, I mean, usually it's the, the first thing that the physicists do, right? He, he knows the different time scale of his system, and then he look at uh, the fluctuation. He, 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 he compute empirically uh, the correlation time. So you have to have a knowledge of uh, your, your your dynamics. And so in many systems, you have multiple correlation time. So for instance, if I come back to uh, these uh, processes here. 
So you have waves, which are called Rossby waves, that carry the cyclonic and anticyclonic anomaly. So you know how they travel around the planet. And then if you look at the, the temperature which are correlated to, to those waves, so the correlation time will be typically of a few days. So it's, a bit, it's called the synoptic time scale. So it's the correlation time of, of the weather. But then, of course, this is, uh, you have slow drivers. For instance, it can be affected by the slow evolution of the temperature of the ocean, or it can be affected by El Nino, or by uh, this or that. And so you, you, you might have slow drivers that act on other time scale. And so you also have a seasonal cycle, uh, and so on and so forth. And so, of course, you, you have to discuss this time scale on your systems and to argue whether uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, valid. <clears throat> so, for instance, here, if I discuss this for this case, which is the return time for an extreme heat wave, so you see here, I, I look at during the summer, it lasts three months. So the summer is much longer than this three days correlation time. So I can have several heat waves during the summer that would be uncorrelated. And then I am looking at from one summer to another, uh, what is the probability to have an event that has a probability as small as coming back every 1,000 years. So basically, the heat wave of next year is completely uncorrelated with the heat waves of this year. And so it's true for this case that they are completely uncorrelated. Oh, so this, uh, this is a plot for uh, heat wave de defined at the European scale. And so it's a 90 day average so I, I will I will give detail about this uh, this plot la later. So the French heat wave lasted about a month. So here we have ninety days heat wave. So it's even more rare. So here it's basically the seasonal average of the temperature. And so as, a, as a, I answered before, I mean, everything depends much on the definition. So a one month heat wave is, is different from a 90 days heat wave. So it's different from a heat wave. The heat waves over Europe is different from heat waves over Western Europe or over France. So we, 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 have, we have tested this study in many of our contexts. So this is a, a for instance, picture made in the PhD thesis of uh, Thibault Letan, where you can see here a lattice Boltzmann si simulation of 2D turbulent flow. So you have a flow which is, you have a flow that comes on a grid of obstacle. It produces some turbulence, and this turbulence then interact with an obstacle. Here the obstacle is this uh, uh, square, and then you you look at how it interacts with, with the obstacle. And here we were computing the drag and looking at extreme events for the drag. And so for instance, this is uh, uh, the statistics for the drag. So here you, you, you have, so for instance, in this case, you saying we have uh, empirically computed the correlation time, which is basically the typical time your flow needs to pass through the, the obstacle. Uh, it's just an advection time of the same order of magnitude. And then here we have a few hundreds of this correlation time. And then we see we look at the, the very rare events, the value of the drag, which are extremely large. So we have studied this a lot directly and using algorithms that come from a large deviation theory. And so, for instance, here I show you uh, we, we 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 had extremely we, we have very extreme drag value, much more extreme than uh, the one I was showing on the plot before. And you see here the. The, the streamlines and the pressure for four events with the most extreme drag. And actually, what is visible here is that qualitatively, at least, the way this occurs is always the same. And so here it's always through a very big um, um, negative pressure anomaly uh, that is produced because uh, the flow is making something like the streamlines are making something like a cap. Uh, usually, uh, that, uh, so the, the vorticity is produced along the boundary. Usually, the, pro the vorticity goes very fast 
uh, away. But if uh, for some reason it produces the streamline produce a cap, then it can maintain for uh, some amount of time a very large amount of vorticity locally. And then this produces this very uh, huge uh, uh, cyclonic anomaly, and this is this gives this huge fluctuation uh, for the for the drag. And so here the it's much less clear than uh, uh, in, in my previous uh, example, but it seems to that uh, the patterns for these extreme events are predictable here. So it's, it might be related to some instanton. So here the signature of the instanton is much less clear, but uh, still uh, the, uh, the, 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 there is something about it. So the, the idea is that those rare events will always occur the, the same way if they are rare enough. So I will give you a, a, a qualitative idea. So for instance, you want to go through the Rockies here. So you are walking, you don't know your way. So you go randomly. So it's quite difficult. So the probability to go through is very low. And so some of you will find the good way to go and they will actually go. And this, this then if you, if you, uh, condition on the fact that you succeed and you look at the path, condition on the path that you succeed, then you will see that all the one that succeeded will be the one that have chosen the, the easiest path. So basically they will go through the valley and then go through the path and then go through the valley. And so basically a dynamical system, it's just, it works just this way. The, the dynamics goes randomly, but if you then condition on the fact that you succeeded, then you find that uh, among all the unlikely path to go, the most likely path is the one that is present, uh, predominantly seen. Okay, so this, this qualitative idea, which is very simple and very powerful in many cases, this is the, the idea that I would like to, to put forward theoretically using the large deviation theory. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Yeah, yeah. This is a very, very important question. So well, I, I, I have told you about the Arrhenius law, which is an equilibrium law, about statistical mechanics application with ferromagnets or these things. But why should it be valid also for turbulent flow? And so this is really what the key message I want to give you today. Okay. I will try to explain you that for any data system, this should be true. And then maybe we will point on uh, differences between equilibrium system and non-equilibrium system. But it will be true for non-equilibrium system. And I, I hope uh, that uh, after this lecture, you, 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 you will get the, the answer. So we have also made application in uh, astronomy. So for instance, this is a, a old picture by your colleagues in Paris. His name is Jacques Lascar. Jacques was the first to prove that the solar system is chaotic. Uh, in uh, the late uh, 80s. Uh, and so he, he, he is a very uh, uh, influential and interesting person in, in astronomy. And so this is one of his simulations. So you see the time scale here. Uh, so uh, uh, the time scale are in millions of years. And he, he had subtracted uh, uh, billions, three billions of years. And so here you have a few millions of years a time scale, but after this is very far in the, in the, in the future of uh, the solar system. And so you see the, you see that, uh, you see the, the distance of the planets towards the sun. So there is one for the, for the earth uh, in astronomical units. And so you have Venus, Mercury and Mars. And so you see that uh, at some periods, uh, the systems can become quite unstable. Uh, because of what happened before. And so you, you see that here the, the Earth and Venus can exchange their position uh, several times and uh, possibly they could collide. And so the point here is what is the collision probability? So here you see it's not for tomorrow. Uh, we are talking of uh, times of order of billions of years. 
So it's not a problem for us, but it's interesting because it is actually these kinds of events that explain the history of the, the, the solar systems or other uh, planetary systems. And so this is again why we care. It's because uh, once it occurs, it matters, right? If you have a, if if you have a, a planet that collides the Earth and makes the Moon, then the the Earth will be different, and maybe. Uh, this would this will be this will impact a lot the, the the earth in the in the future so you you really want to understand the probability of of this event and so this is a, a paper that i have we have written with a, a phd uh, students eric Vallez, where we have shown that uh, for a simplified model we we have actually shown that uh, there is an instant on for the uh, reaching the resonance between mercury and jupiter and this is the phenomena that explain that the systems becomes unstable at some point. Uh, uh, and it's, it's the, 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 the door towards the instability of the inner part of the solar system. And so here, we don't know yet if this is true and valid for the real solar systems, but actually for the simplified model, which is called the batigin borbidelli olman model, this is the, the, what we have illustrated is that the, 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 the dynamics here is concentrated close to a single path. Okay, so I hope that I, uh, you you have seen uh, several examples of rare events in the chemical system matter that are important to study. And so the, the question is, uh, it's, a, it's a problem in itself. So we, we need to develop specific tools because the events are so rare. So here, if we talk to events, uh, 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 hundred or hundreds of thousands uh, uh, times, if the time scale for the event to occur is orders of magnitude larger than the time scale of the dynamics of your systems, it means that numerically it will be very hard. For instance, if you want to do MHD experiments to reproduce this transition, to get one transition, it's, it's, it's already extremely difficult given the very large and small number that Keith has shown. So if you want them to study them and you want thousands of them, it will be uh, a huge difficulty. So if you want to attack this problem, you should really do something else, something different. And so the, if we want to compute the probability and the dynamics of those relevance, if we want to assess whether or not the dynamics is predictable, whether we have this instant on or not, and see, if we really want to have a lot of statistics to, to, to really understand their probability and their dynamics, then uh, uh, you, we need something else. And so this is where the large deviation theory might be useful. So uh, they might be useful to devise algorithm to, to, to make a numerical simulation more reasonable. And uh, we want also to understand the basics of this relevance in, in this dynamical system. Okay. Do you have question about this introduction? Yes. Yes. Well, it's a bit the same question as the one of Hussein. So it's 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 a very good question. It's often very difficult one, and it's a case by case study. So it's a, so it's, sometimes you you can have memory because you have actually many of these multi-stable states. So you, you, you look at it, it seems that it doesn't have memory, but suddenly it jumps to another state, and this gives you memory. And maybe the, the real transition you, you care is uh, even more rare. And so then you, so you, may, you may have a hierarchy of time scale. Uh, and so there is no, no rule. I mean, uh, many different things are possible in nature about this hierarchy of time scale. Okay, so you, you, you will have to, to answer this question on a case by case uh, basis. Okay, so I come back now to the theory. So the rest of the lecture today will be basically a very fast lecture about large deviation theory. Uh, uh, so I will begin with very simple examples. So there will not be much physics in the remaining, but it's, it's more about uh, the theoretical approach to, to, to do it. So let me come back to the meaning of this symbol here. Yeah. So I told you that it is called, it, it can be called log equivalence. It means that the log 
these symbols mean that the log of the left-hand side is equivalent to the log of the right-hand side. Or equivalently, we can write that the limit when epsilon goes to zero of epsilon multiplied by the log of f is minus f. And so this is equivalent to that and equivalent to the fact that the log of the left-hand side is equivalent to the log of the right-hand side. So let me give you an example. For instance, if you take f of x of epsilon, is C multiplied by epsilon to the power alpha multiplied by exponential of minus F divided by epsilon. So here we call C epsilon to the alpha the prefactor. So you see that it actually depends on epsilon. So here the equivalent would be epsilon to C epsilon to the alpha exponential of minus F divided by epsilon. But if I take the log first and then I multiply by epsilon, then you see that uh, this will go like epsilon log of epsilon. So it, it will go to zero. So it means that f of x and epsilon is actually log equivalent to exponential of minus f of x divided by epsilon. So it means that this log equivalence is less strong than the real equivalence. It means that we lost the prefactor basically. So it's bad because we don't have the real equivalent, but it's good because it's simple. And actually, uh, uh, not to consider the prefactor leads us to have things that are much more uh, 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 much more simple and much more generic. And actually, it gives you to much more universal behavior. So maybe you are used to that in statistical mechanics already. I mean, if you look at the thermodynamical potential and these things, you know that they don't really depend on the shape of your systems, on uh, the types of boundary you have, and so on and so forth. And so when you have a thermodynamical potential, it's, it's very simple, it's valid for any systems. But then when you come because look at surface phenomena, then it's different, it is at the next order, and then everything depends, everything is related to the prefactor, and then everything depends on many details. And then you don't, Sometimes you need to understand those details, but many times you don't really want to care about them. Okay, so this is the point about this log equivalence. It's, it's, uh, it's very nice to have uh, the, the exponential part, uh, which is the one that uh, uh, gives you the, the most variation when epsilon is changed, but you forget about the algebraic part. So we'll see this now on an example that you, you might have uh, considered in, in mathematics or in physics, which are called Laplace integrals. So here I look at the integral of uh, g of x multiplied by exponential of minus f of x divided by epsilon. And then the mathematical question uh, is what is the limit of this integral when epsilon goes to zero? And then there is an answer, probably you, you, you might have worked this out, when the minimum of f, so here you see that because of this exponential factor and because epsilon is small, one over epsilon is large and there is an exponential. So it means that basically if your function f is like that, so you have your interval a and b. So if your function f is like that, so this will be the minimum x star. So you see that anything here, it is exponentially smaller. So between this point and this point, you have exponential of minus delta divided by epsilon, right? And so this is very small. So this is hugely small, okay? And so you see that the only thing that really matters is what occurs close to the minimum. And so you, what you will do is you will uh, expand, maybe with a Taylor expansion around the minimum. And so you see that the main contribution will come from the minimum. And then next order, you will have a Gaussian integral because uh, when you expand, uh, so you are close to a minimum. And so the, the first derivative will, uh, will be zero. And then at next order, you, 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 you will have something quadratic. And then you rescale uh, x around here. So you see that the contribution here will, the, the scale that matter will be of order of square root of epsilon. So you change a variable and so on. And when, when you do this exercise, then you find at the end, but it's equivalent to exponential of minus one of epsilon multiplied by f of x star, where x star is the value of the minimum. 
And then here you have a factor that comes from the Gaussian integral. And so you get a, a G of X star, uh, the value at the minimum of, of G, multiplied by the square root of uh, two pi epsilon, multiplied here by the second derivative of F at X star. This comes from the Gaussian integral. So I guess many of you have already made this exercise, right? Or you can do it, it's easy to do it. It's, it's done in the lecture notes. But if actually, if, if actually the minimum occurs not at the interior, but if it occurs at the boundary, for instance, if it's like that, A and B, then you will do about the same kinds of computation, but it's different here because it's not true anymore that the, the first derivative vanish because you are at the boundary. And so when you will expand around here, you will have the first derivative contribution. And then you do again the exercise, so you still get the exponential factor, but you see that the, the prefactor is different. Here it was the square root of epsilon, now it is epsilon to the power one, and here it was depending on the second derivative of f, now you have the first derivative of f. Okay, so you, so you, you understand that the exponential factor is very general, you can explain it very easily, but the prefactor will depend on the detail, it depends whether you are at the bottom or not, so in dimension one, this is easy to understand, but in larger dimension, you might have many different kinds of effects at the boundary. And so uh, everything will become tricky and universal. So, but for any of these cases, the, the, the log equivalence result is that the integral of j of x multiplied by this exponential is log equivalent to exponential of minus f of x star divided by epsilon, where x star is just the value where you get the minimum of f. Right? So now we want to, so we could do that for path integral, for instance. So this is how it worked in many cases in statistical mechanics uh, to do this, uh, it's often called a saddle point approximation or something like that. And so it's basically the same as this, but then you work in, in, in space, which are much more complex. It's, it's not one thing, it's not just uh, X that belong to R, but it's a path that belong to uh, a path space. And so you would like this kinds of reasoning to generalize easily to very complex uh, space in dimension D, in, in, in finite dimension for path space and so on and so forth. And so that's where you, you got to large, to, to, to large deviation. If you have what? If you have a minimum at the right boundary. Yeah, yeah. If you have a minimum at the right boundary, it would be the same. Yeah, yeah. But then you, you, you have many situations. You, you can have a situation where the, the first derivative vanish here, or the, even the second derivative could vanish. So you could have many, many cases, many different cases. But the exponential factor will always be correct. And so then there is something called Laplace principle in, uh, in uh, probability theory, in uh, large deviation theory, which will be basically uh, uh, you have these kinds of uh, integral over some uh, very complex space of G of X multiplied by exponential of minus one over epsilon I H of X, exponential of one minus epsilon I of X, where I will be a rate function well, it will always be given by the exponential of minus the infimum over this uh, two function divided by epsilon. Okay, so if we want to generalize this mathematically to very abstract uh, setup, then you go in large deviation theory and you have a definition of what is called a large deviation principle. So I will not explain you this. So actually it's not very useful for physicists. Mathematically, it's a very hard topic. So you, you just have, uh, a big thick textbook just to explain you the details about uh, uh, large deviation principle and uh, the topology that goes with that. And so for instance, uh, this is a typical definition of a large deviation principle. Uh, let X uh, epsilon be a family of free random variable with probability measure mu epsilon. Then we will say that the sequence of measure mu epsilon uh, satisfy the large deviation principle with rate i 
if those two inequalities are satisfied, the limit sup of epsilon log of mu epsilon of c is much smaller than is smaller or equal to the minus the infimum of i of x for x belonging to c, where c is uh, uh, any closed set. And then you have, a, uh, so this is a lower bound, then you have an upper bound for every open set. Okay, and then basically what this means is that it's equivalent to the statements that for any h, uh, any function h, which has this property to be bounded and continuous on this space, then you can basically have the Laplace principle, meaning that you have this uh, the validity of uh, the same result as the one for the Laplace integral in dimension one or two. Okay, so I will, as a physicist, I never go into this mathematical detail. I just do things formally. Uh, I don't verify the, the, the mathematics. And I want to explain you today very basic idea uh, at, uh, at the formal level. Yes? You, on the right hand side, this, this? Oh, epsilon. So here, we, there is the log here. Okay, so the, here the, the meaning of this is that we have a lot of deviation uh, for P epsilon. So it means that P epsilon here, of X, if I write it formally, it means this, but it's exponential of minus I of X divided by epsilon. Okay, so this is the meaning of, this is the, the mathematical formula that corresponds to this uh, statement, right? So here in this integral, you have exponential of minus h of x divided by epsilon multiplied by the exponential of this one, and maybe some other things, some factors and some other things. And then you see it's just like here, okay? And then you get uh, naturally the same kinds of result as the one I was explaining you before for the Laplace integral. Okay, so the, it is the large the definition of a large deviation principle like that allows you to have this Laplace principle for any function h uh, that has the correct uh, property. So there was another question, yeah. It is the rate, yes, for this uh, probability here. For the probability of, uh, so here, x, so here it's very abstract. It's a, it's, a, it's a family of free random variable. Then we will like, apply this to many different things, to, to random variable, to path, and so on. So in general, I has some property. It is continuous, indeed. Uh, uh, yes. So it is always positive. Its minimum is always zero. So you have some property that you can derive. It's very general. There's no power law or anything. No, no. Here it's a it's just a definition, actually. Yeah. yeah. Which program? Research. I don't know about it. Okay. I don't know. But what is sure is that, uh, as you will see, we always got uh, infimum principle. And basically, most of the uh, uh, variational problems in physics, they, they nearly all come from there. Basically, from so if you think about the least action principle, if you think about all the, the principle you, you have, when you minimize the surface of a bubble and so on and so forth, they, they all come from, from, from large deviation theory. Okay, so I will now look at the large deviation for the sum of n uh, identically distributed random variable, which is the simplest cases. 
and you will see it's it's quite easy to to understand in this case. So I have a n random variable x1, xn. They are independent and identically distributed random variables. So it, the, the probability distribution from one of them is denoted p0. p0 is the PDF for each of these variables. So for instance, if I assume that p0 as an average and uh, uh, that the standard deviation exists, exist, then you consider the sum, which is called the empirical sum, sum. So you just sum over n outcome of uh, this, the value of this random variable, and then you make the average. And you call this Sn. And then you, you have what is called the law of large number. You, you all know this. You expect that the, uh, this empirical sum goes to the average mu. Okay? So this is called the, the law of large number. Then you might be interested in the fluctuation about this sum Sn. And so you have learned that the fluctuation are of order of square root of n, right? The relative fluctuation are, are of order of one over square root of n. So then what you need to do uh, in order to study the fluctuation, is you need to subtract the average. So you need to rescale. You see here, I, the scaling was one over n. Now the, the, I rescale, it's one over square root of n, just because, because I have subtracted the average, and the, all of, the average of all of this is zero. And I, I will be able to look at the, the fluctuation. And then if you consider this sum, after uh, changing the, the scaling here, you have what is called the central limit theorem. The probability measure of Zn converge to a center Gaussian distribution of variance sigma, where sigma, uh, sorry, of a standard deviation sigma, where sigma was a standard deviation of, of p naught. Okay, so you, you all know that, I guess. But then, what if you want to go beyond that? Because here you see that we are looking at fluctuation of order of square root of n. But you might have fluctuation of order n, actually, in this sum, or fluctuation of order one when you have normalized the sum by one over n. And so here we will be interesting in looking at fluctuation of order one for Sn. So this is very rare. And since you, 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 you have a dice, and if you want fluctuation, if you, if you, if you, if you want your dice to give you a, a multiple of five n times, it means that most of the time you should get six, five, or four. So it's very rare to, to, to do that if you want to, 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 to have this n time for n large. So it will be exponentially rare, actually. And so then you, you have a large deviation principle for this that tells you that the probability that Sn is equal to S, where S is any number, so it could be the average mu, but it could be far from the average. Then it will go like the exponential of minus i of S, where i of s will be given by this formula. It will be the supremum of ks minus lambda of k. So this is what is called a Legend functional transform. And the function lambda here is what is called the cumulant generating function for the probability for the distribution p0. So you just compute the average of exponential of k x1. You, you compute the log of the average, and this gives you this function lambda. OK? so. This is the result. The result is called Kramer's theorem. So we will prove the result soon. So it's always it's, it's often the case when you look at asymptotics for random variables that you have this uh, triptychs. You have the low flash number that tells you about the average. You have the central limit theorems that tells you about the typical fluctuation. And then you might be interested in, in more rare fluctuation. And then you get a large deviation principle. But they, include, they are included one in the other, usually, except for specific cases. So when you have the large deviation principle, you automatically get the central limit theorem with some assumption. And when you have the central limit theorem, you, I mean, you, you also get the, the lower flash number. So let me give you a, a very simple example that you all know. So here, I consider the density fluctuation of a perfect gas. A perfect gas is a gas for which I can neglect the interaction between the particles. So I put the particle in a box. So the particles are the blue dots here. So I have n particles. And I look at the, now the density locally. So for instance, I look at this uh, dashed box, and I will count the numbers of particles I have in this dashed box. So here I have many particles. Here I have only two. 
by chance. Okay, so it's quite rare to have only two particles in this dash box. And so my question is, what is the, the probability to, to have this? And so because the, the, you can consider a particle are statistically independent, this is the hypothesis of a perfect gas. The probability to be inside the box, it's just P, which is the volume of a small box, divided by the volume of a large box. And then the probability to be outside, just one minus P. So then this is a simple uh, exercise you already did in statistical physics. So you know that uh, the, the numbers of particles inside the box follow the uh, binomial distribution with parameter P. Okay, so you just have to enumerate, to count. And then we, when you do this exercise, you, 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 you have this formula. So if I, I call Xn, N over N, the ratio of a particle in the small box, then I get this binomial formula. So P to the power N, one minus P to the power capital N minus small N. And then you have this binomial factor. And so you, you get here, it's expressed now in terms of X. And so you, you can compute explicitly in this case. So I guess you did that in, a, in, in lecture in statistical mechanics. And then you take the limit when N goes to infinity and you look at what's happening. And so you can look at the central limit theorem, but you can go further. And so you can use Stirling approximation. And so Boltzmann was the first to do this computation using Stirling approximation in the 19th century. And so what he got is that the log of Pn is equivalent, is equivalent to minus N multiplied by X log of X uh, divided by P plus one minus X multiplied by the log of one minus X divided by one minus P. This is what we get with, with the Stirling formula. And you see, this is a large deviation principle. You have a log of a probability, which is equivalent to minus N multiplied by something. Here, epsilon is one over N, okay? This is exactly what is written here. It's, it's just uh, an example of, uh, for here, we, we, we computed it explicitly through the, the binom bi binomial formula, but at the end, it's just a large deviation result. And here you recognize the, actually the volume part of the entropy in thermodynamics, okay? This is X here, uh, P is just the ratio of the two volume. So if you expand this, you just get the volume part of the, the entropy in, in, in thermodynamics. And so the point is that here we were able to, to do it because we know the binomial and the Stirling distribution, but we would like to be able to generalize this computation very easily to, to, to much more complex cases. One point I want to make here with this example is how it converges, how fast it converges. Usually the convergence is very fast. So here you see this distribution, this binomial distribution, when we have n samples with n equal 5, 20, 50, and 100. And so here's just the, the PN of X. So it's the distribution which is not uh, uh, normalized. And so you see that uh, the larger n, for instance, the yellow one is for n equal 100. I mean, the more picked is the distribution. And then the typical width is of, is of order of one over square root of n, and then it will converge uh, towards a, a Gaussian distribution. So here on the right side, you see i n of x. i n is defined this way. I just take minus one over n, the log of p n, and I expect it to converge to some i p of x, which is given by this formula. And so here you see how fast it converges. And so you see that you don't see the yellow line. So the, the, the red one is the, the limit. You don't see the yellow one, it, it, it is indistinguishable. The green line, you hardly can distinguish it. And even the blue one, even the blue one, it's quite, quite good here close to x equal to zero. So it means that even for x equal to five, even for fluctuations that are, are, are of order of uh, 10 to 20%, the, the convergence is, is, is already quite good. But for n equal 100, you have, already, you have a wonderful convergence in, or, in order to describe probability which are extremely rare. So this is 
this is kind of uh, interesting to see how fast it, it converges. Yeah, the, the, the reason why you, you, it converges fast is, is, is indeed because you take the log, right? Right. So when I divide by n, uh, so this is the limit, and this is log n divided by n. So that's still small, and uh, then you have some prefactor, and the convergence is, 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 is very fast. So the convergence is extremely fast, but of course you, you, you lost something, you lost the prefactor because you took the, the, the log. So here X, you see, by definition, x is a positive variable because x is the ratio, uh, is, it's a number of particles divided by the total number of particles. So here you know from the beginning that x will be bonded between zero and one. And actually you see that this function here, they are actually defined between zero and one and they diverge, uh, the, the, the first derivative of this function diverge for zero and, and, and one. So this is what you see here on this, property, so they have a finite limit, but the, uh, the boundary diver. So if you make a Gaussian approximation, you see that the Gaussian approximation, it, it's certainly wrong for a large value of X because the Gaussian approximation does not know about these limits. Okay, so the Gaussian approximation gives you a number of particles which can be negative or larger than N, right? For x smaller than zero, it's not physical, so we don't care. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so here, you, okay, so here there is a problem. You you say yeah. So pro probably x here is um, so you see, yeah. So I guess there is an error here because I I have subtracted the average. Okay, so this is actually x between zero and one. And this is probably X minus the average, which is 0.2 here. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is X minus 0.2, I guess. Yeah, yeah. thank you, yes, there is. I have to correct this. There was, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you the receipt to, to make this computation. So first, I have already talked about the cumulant generating function, which is the, the log of the average of the exponential of kx, right? So this is a classical definition. You, you might know about it. So if, if you expand i of k in power of k, you get as a coefficient what are called the cumulants of this distribution. So now if we expect a large deviation principle of this form with this, f of x divided by epsilon. Then here, I guess, if you want to compute the average of exponential of kx, this will, contribution will be near negligible of this. So you have to rescale, actually. You have to compute the average of something which is exponential of kx divided by epsilon. You have to rescale k accordingly. And then you will get something which is, contains an interesting information. You will take the log, and then you will see that you, you have to put epsilon in front of it to get a proper limit. And so this lambda here is called the scale cumulant generating function. It means that we have properly scaled it with epsilon. It's still a cumulant generating function, but it is scaled with epsilon. And so this is the definition of the scale cumulant generating function. Or equivalently, it's the same as saying that the average of exponential of k epsilon divided by epsilon is log equivalent to exponential of lambda k divided by epsilon. Okay, this is just a definition so far. Then if I know this, <clears throat> if I know that there is a large deviation rate, 
So I know that P epsilon of X is exponential of minus E epsilon of X divided by epsilon. If I want to compute this average, then I will see that I have a Laplace integral here. I will use the Laplace principle and I will get that this average is uh, log equivalent to exponential of sub supremum of, over X of K X minus I of X divided by epsilon. And so this is just, if you remember the, on the, my previous slide, my definition here of uh, the scale cumulant generating function, then what you can see here is that by a Laplace principle, I get that lambda of K is the supremum over X of K X minus I of X. And so you see that the scale cumulant generating function comes with this sup formula, what is called a Legend Financial Transform. So the, the result is that the scale function is the Legend Financial Transform of a large deviation rate function. And so this, this is a very general result. The point is that some, sometimes it's very easy to compute the scale cumulant generating function. And so we, we would like to understand whether we can invert this formula or not. Is it allowed to invert this formula or not? And if we can do that, how shall we do? And so there is a, a very general result based on the basics in convex analysis that tells you that if I is convex, then the Legend functional transform is invertible and I of X is actually the supremum over K of KX minus lambda of K. But you need to, I has to be convex. So if you don't have the information about I, there is something which is called the gartner ellis theorem that tells you that if lambda is differentiable, then I exists and I of X is actually given by the, this inversion formula. Okay, so it means that you can compute lambda and if lambda is differentiable, then the large deviation rate function exists and it is the Legend functional transform of the scale cumulant generating function. Yeah, I will stop uh, immediately. I mean, just, just after this uh, last slide. So then if, if I, for instance, if I take this example of the sum of n identically distributed random variable, I can compute the scale cumulant generating function. So it's one over n, a log of the average of this, then this will be the average of the exponential of a sum. The exponential of a sum is a, is a product of exponential. And then the random variable are independent. So I can take the average of the product as the product of the average. And then I get the log of the average of one of the variable to the power n, and I make the computation and I get this uh, formula. So here it was extremely easy. It's uh, two lines of computation to show that the scale cumulant generating function is this, uh, this formula. Then you can prove easily that lambda is differentiable and convex. And then this gives you immediately the large deviation rate function that I, I gave you as a result. And this is what is called Kramer theorem. So it's a very easy recipe in order to get the result. So here I can now use this theorem. I don't know, I don't need to know about the Stirling formula. I immediately compute this, I plug it in, and I get the large deviation rate function. And I can do that for any distribution. Okay, and so this is the, the basic proof of a Kramer theorem. Okay, so tomorrow I will continue and I will give you very simple idea about similar results for dynamical problems. Mm -hmm. And then we will go to, towards the application. Right, so glass is a very interesting phenomenon, isn't it? glass dynamics, uh, glassy dynamics. And it, it's, it's, it's actually, um, 
a case where when you look at microscopically, you see that uh, the system is, is very uh, constrained. And then you have many, you have thousands and thousands of metastable points. And then the systems uh, jump slowly from one to another. But then you have a hierarchy of time scale, and sometimes it's, it, it's uh, this hierarchy has some algebraic property. And then at the end, you see that uh, the relaxation because of this is rather than being exponential, it looks like more al algebraic. So glass is a very specific case for which you don't have just one attractor or two or a few, but you have uh, thousands of them. And so then uh, whether you, so you cannot use a large deviation theory to study this relaxation process, but for glass, you can still use large deviation theory to study other things. Uh, and there are many works using large deviation theory for, for, for glass. Yeah, the point, so you see that, <clears throat> so here, here the point of the mathematician was to generalize this Laplace principle to functional space, basically, space of function. For instance, if you want to study how the dynamics evolve, you have a function that depends on time, or if you want to study something, a field in space, it can be something other than time. So then the mathematics for this is very tricky because you have functional space, you have to define probability in functional space, you have to define integration on functional space, many very diffi difficult things. So this is why they have to, to do that, okay? And then it's, um, <clears throat> you know, the point is that computing probability there, it's, it's, it's tricky. And so you, you, you have to work uh, with uh, open sets and uh, closed sets and uh, uh, Borel family and so on and so forth. Yeah, the fact that there is a super and an if and inf here, but uh, I, I I I must yeah I don't I I I don't know the answer. I, I would have to to study again the math I did that long ago, but I don't remember.